Jason, as well as uh, our tech analysts, uh, where we'll be also highlighting some of our few overweight uh, sectors uh, after the market strategy. I guess that to actually set the tone for the second quarter, um, overall, we reiterate our positive view on the market. Um, I think on the macro front, the global interest rate um, cycle are likely to have peak, um, likelihood of the Fed's uh, cutting rates in the second half uh, this year, and the reason um, strong macro data are uh, pointing towards, um, towards a recovery so all these are, are likely to, to, to see a more uh, a positive uh, market as well as on, on, on the macro front. And of course, uh, if you look at year to date, uh, Malaysia has definitely been one of the better uh, performing market uh, within the Asia region. Okay, um, basically, if you look at the first, uh, the first quarter, just a bit of a recap, uh, Malaysia continues uh, to... Um, to see ringgit uh, weakening um, against the against the dollar. Uh, if you look in terms of the regional currency as well, um, it has also weakened. So it's definitely not something that is only happening in, in, in Malaysia. Um, but um, the culprit of a weaker ringgit um, has been largely due to a, a few factors. I think number one is um, the 2023 GDP expectation um, actually came in uh, weaker at about 3.7%. Um, and on top of that, on the macro side, um, the global market uh, were already expecting a uh, quicker interest rate cut, um, but has since um, expect this uh, timeline to be pushed back, um, which has been supporting the stronger dollar. I think that if I'm not mistaken, uh, market actually started out with about more than five cuts, and it's only now down to about three and with the recent uh, Israel-Iran um, tension, uh, market could possibly uh, further push back this expectation um, in terms of timeline um, on the fear of a heightened uh, inflation. Um, but all that being said, uh, we do expect uh, Ringgit to actually uh, be better uh, in the second half. Um, again, if you look in terms of the uh, global semiconductor sales, um, it has been showing a good recovery momentum. Um, the global E and E sales recovery is uh, a bellwether of the Malaysia E and E um, export improvement uh, in the coming days. Um, on top of that, um, if you look in terms of the government economic reform, um, the NETR, the National Industrial uh, Master Plan twenty thirty, uh, twelve MP, all those are basically. Um, positive initiate, uh, initiative um, for Malaysia and government um, higher DE spending uh, for investment uh, to actually stimulate the economy uh, by reviving some of the key projects were, were that were likely to support um, the local ringgit as well. I think that this is uh, not something new. Um, Malaysia has always um, benefited strongly in terms of the FDI inflows, um, which is what we can see on the left um, especially on the manufacturing front uh, last year. Um, on the right, basically, um, you will see that um, in terms of the recovery, in terms of the tourism sector, continue to show a positive sign. Um, the air passenger uh, traffic volume is improving and, and, and likely on track. So we, we do believe that a combination of all these factors um, will, will likely drive a, a, a stronger uh, ringgit despite the 3% um, weakness that we have saw in, in, in the first quarter. I think that one of the other things that investors should, should also have a take a look is in the 10-year US Treasury yield, um, as this also helps to predict the ringgit movement. Um, as you can see here, um, as yield reduce, uh, ringgit tend to strengthen in tandem. Um, and we, we are expecting uh, Ringgit to actually be one of the better performing currency this year, uh, reversing uh, uh, um, last year losses um, on the back of the government domestic reform agenda um, on, on both the economy as well as the fiscal front. Um, yeah, so um, for, for this year, uh, we are expecting Ringgit to strengthen uh, towards the 440 as well, uh, as, well as the 4, 450 region from the current uh, 470, 480. 
Um, again, this is just a repetitive of, of what I uh, touched on earlier on. Um, basically, we, we do expect um, to see uh, inflation um, has already peaked and, and likely um, the Fed funds rate will, will, will gradually reduce uh, in, in the second half. Um, this, is, uh, this is just a quick summary of uh, what we'll be running through uh, for the Malaysia market strategy. Um, as usual, a quick uh, market recap, uh, second quarter outlook, as well as uh, where our strategy lies. Um, if you look at um, the chart on the left, um, first quarter is definitely off to a very good start, uh, which actually saw global market uh, continue to trend higher um, as mentioned, uh, this is um, partly due to market actually scaling back um, on the rate cut expectation uh, following the surprising um, stronger economic data. Um, as such, um, market sentiment was overall better. Um, US large cap, um, as you can see, uh, continue to outshine, uh, driven by a more broad-based uh, uh, sector performance. Uh, within the developed market, uh, Japan, um, which uh, did very well, um, which, which did very well last year, uh, continue to top the chart uh, in, in the first quarter uh, this year. Um, I think that, again, this is due to a combination of factors, um, better corporate, uh, corporate uh, growth, um, the regulatory and corporate governance reform effort has starting to take place, as well as the weakening in terms of the yen. Um, Taiwan, no surprise, uh, continue to see a strong uh, investor interest, um, especially in the semiconductor front um, due to the AI excitement. Um, but, but it's not too bad for our local market. Uh, KLCI um, is one of the top performing market in Asia, like I mentioned. Um, KLCI is up about 6%. Uh, small cap actually performing slightly better uh, compared to the CI. Um, so that overall, that actually put us uh, right about in the middle compared to the other regional markets. Um, in terms of the sector and stock performance, uh, as you can see here, uh, utility uh, sector continue to be the best performing sector um, thanks to YTL, which uh, was up by uh, YTL power, my apologies, which was up by about 50% um, year to date. Um, Tanaga, I think, is, is up in the teens. Um, if you look in terms of across the other sectors, um, the energy, property, construction are also among some of the sectors that has uh, done well. And of course, in line with the uh, decent KLCI performance, I think that on the top right, uh, at the bottom right chart, you can see that most of the top 30 uh, CI components um, actually shows a positive return. Um, excluding the likes of your pet deck, you know, your public bank, um, Petronas Chemical, Maxis, you know, and, and the likes. Okay, um, so this table here basically shows you the foreign equity fund flow um, of the Asia 6 market and Malaysia. Um, as you can see here, um, focus on the focus on the second as well as the third column from the right. So basically that's that actually shows you the Asia 6 as well as the Malaysia uh, inflow or outflow. Um, so basically for the first two months uh, for 2024, uh, Malaysia saw a foreign money inflow in the range of 100 to 200 million US dollar. Um, but that quickly reversed um, in, in the month of uh, March, whereby we saw a greater reversal of about 600 over million um, US dollar. But on the contrary, um, the Asia 6, um, that's, that's, uh, you can see that on the dark blue um, row. You can see that Asia 6 actually saw about 18 billion of uh, equity inflow, uh, mostly into uh, Korea, mostly into Taiwan, um, driven by the continuous interest into AI and, and tech-related stocks. Um, so basically, uh, um, this is basically just a repetitive uh, as well as a summary um, of, of what I mentioned. Um, as you can see on the bottom uh, right-hand uh, column, you can see that the, the, our foreign shareholding um, for the Malaysia equity market has uh, bottomed um, for now. Um, and, and it's now hovering, uh, hovering at about 20% uh, region. Okay, um, I think that 
um, from here on, we will start um, moving into our second quarter um, outlook. Um, basically, uh, over the next few slides, uh, we actually highlighted a few themes which we think that investors should actually take a very close look um, in the second quarter as well as the second half. I think firstly is on the FDI, uh, your foreign um, direct investment as well as the trade diversion team. I think that is no surprises that Malaysia has attracted a huge amount of FDI and even more so uh, during this uncertain time um, when US and China is having a lot of um, uh, uh, conflict, you know, that actually resulted in, in, in the geopolitical tension. And as a result, this has uh, led to uh, a lot of uh, uh, MNCs actually diversifying their supply chain out of China um, under the uh, China Plus One um, strategy. Um, so basically, uh, uh, I think I, I'll not go through on who is the beneficiary because that is something that I'll touch on later on. Um, so that's team number one. I think that um, similar um, here, um, basically, I think that when it comes to the FDIs, um, more often than not, it's just um, centered around the Penang as well as the Johor. I think that Penang, as all of you know, is basically on the tech side and Johor is likely on the property as well as data centers. Um, so I think that, um, yeah, I think, I, I think that uh, for the Penang, um, we will continue to focus on the Malaysia tax. Um, also some of the industrial park developers uh, as well as uh, the MEP providers, um, which actually focus on the semicon as well as data centers, as well as the industrial EMS players. Um, so Johor team, I think, is pretty well known here. Um, we expect news flow to remain positive and, and, and likely to see more development uh, to come. Um, team number three is on the data center team, um, again, uh, which is uh, largely centered around the Klang Valley and Johor. I think that uh, there is a lot of investment pouring into this space, and, and we do believe that there will be more to come. Um, on, 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 on team number four, uh, we would actually like to highlight on the renewable and solar team. Um, with Malaysia aiming to actually scale up the RE um, to about 70% of the installed capacity um, for its uh, overall power mix, um, we, we do believe that there are a lot of uh, solar PV capacity gaps uh, that actually need to be filled in order to achieve uh, this uh, long-term target um, as such, uh, we expect a lot more uh, RE assets tenders to be uh, rolled out. I think that um, um, if, uh, uh, if, if, if you uh, listen to my analysts, um, I think that we estimate about $3 billion, uh, worth of contracts to be rolled out um, by this year uh, relating to CGPP. And with LSS happening, uh, likely to happen next year, I think that that will add an, another about seven billion. So overall, uh, we are looking at um, around the region of about ten billion uh, worth of uh, tenders to be rolled out. Um, lastly, uh, is on the oil and gas. I think that uh, global oil price uh, is looking strong at about ninety dollar per barrel. Um, I think that over the past few days, some of you might have heard about the um, tension between uh, Israel and Iran. Um, so we, we do believe that near-term oil price uh, will be supported by this uh, uncertainty. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, closer back home, if you look in terms of the um, activity outlook um, guided by our national oil company, Petronas, is actually looking positive this year as well. And alongside the higher capex, uh, we, we think that uh, this will be a very good year for the oil and gas. Um, but uh, we believe that there should only be a handful of uh, segments where investors should actually focus on. Um, basically, um, that's on the hookah commissioning, the OSV, the client abandonment side, to name a few. So that's that's the five teams. Uh, uh five teams that we highlighted. Um, in terms of uh, uh, uh these two chart, basically these two chart just shows you that market tends to have a uh, direct correlation um to the ringgit. Um, and with the expectation of a stronger ringgit, uh, market should actually remain uh, quite positive um, in the uh, for the for the following uh, for the remaining part of the year. 
Um, if you look at the global market valuation, uh, I will say that it's not um, it's not too attractive or, or, or too appealing in terms of the valuation. Um, S&P on the left, NASDAQ on the right, um, you can see that um, both is actually trading um, above its uh, mean. And knowing that valuation is not too attractive, um, you, some of you might ask, what are the expectations of the US market this year? Um, as you can see, um, with the scaling back of the interest rates, um, market has generally done very well. Um, but I think that all eyes uh, will be on the US election, which is uh, taking place in November this year. We do agree, uh, we do expect uh, some degree of uh, volatility. Uh, but as you can see at the bottom table, um, based on our analysis over the past six election, I think that uh, US market uh, tend to return positive uh, in the 12 months leading up to the elections. And, and, and with just slightly over um, six months to go, um, we, 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 we do believe that uh, market sentiment will likely be relatively positive. And, and, and why, how, how, how does this matter um, to the Malaysian market is, I think, not surprised to, to, to everyone. Generally, when US um, or the regional market uh, sneeze, you know, um, as again, you can see um, the US, the, uh, sorry, the Iran-Israel tension. Um, last Friday, we saw that um, the regional US market was down by about, about 1% or 2%. Uh, Malaysia market tend to catch a cold like we saw this morning. Um, so, so in that sense, uh, we can expect uh, a lesser market volatility uh, being influenced uh, by the US market. Um, basically, historically, as you can see here, um, the small cap has uh, constantly outperformed the KLCI um, due to the cheaper valuation. I think that earnings profile has been a lot stronger than the large cap. Um, if you look at over the past 10 years, um, small cap only return, uh, small cap return uh, positive uh, out of six out of the 10 years, uh, whereas um, your CI only returned two. Um, and and a, a lot of people you know, has been asking me, um, saying that domestic market valuation um, is looking cheap. Um, if you look in terms of the from a from a piece perspective um, on 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 the graph on the on, on the top, um, it's only trading at about uh, minus one standard deviation. It's a ten year mean. Uh, since uh, uh since uh, twenty twenty one, um, but you know with consensus expecting about fourteen percent KLCI EPS growth, and trading at about fourteen times forward. Um, market is definitely looking um, quite appealing. Um, but we do believe that um, cheap can always stay cheap for, for a period of time, right? Um, as, you, as you guys know, um, our CI is pretty much pre -dom uh, dominated by the traditional um, economy. And, and some of it is being dominated by, um, by the plantation sector. So there are a lot of uh, ESG factor that, that everyone should actually consider, um, which might actually depress the market valuation um, for, for a bit longer. So uh, on that note, uh, we much prefer uh, to be in the small mid cap space uh, where we actually see uh, more values and, and, and a higher alpha. Um, okay, so I think that um, this the, the following three slides um, are probably the most important slide in the whole deck. Um, so you know some something that you guys might want to you know pay a bit more attention. I think that moving into 2024, um, this is how we like to position the market. Um, we are overweight in eight sectors: um, the construction, the EMS, the healthcare, the uh, industrial. Um, oil and gas, the renewables, the rubber glove, as well as tech. Um, so how we actually categorize um, industrial is basically the MEP providers, uh, the mechanical, electrical, as well as the process ut utilities uh, providers, which actually uh, serve the semicon as well as our data centers um, sector. And our 
and, and we are overall just new uh, and we overall we are just neutral on one sector basically that's that's our property and below the the, the table below is basically our top 10 uh, buys um in the malaysia uh within malaysia um arranged by uh, upside um as you can see it's basically uh, across the sector um combination of a circular growth trends as well as a lot of uh, corporate recovery um basically um for instance Cape EMS is an industrial EMS player uh, UMedic um uh, is healthcare uh, Pentec is oil and gas UWC Penta is uh, tech uh, Gamuda is uh, construction Nation Gate is another industrial EMS player Dayang oil and gas Optimax healthcare and Kajaya being another construction play um and in these slides, basically, this is uh, some of our thematic buy calls, um, basically uh, highlighting the structural growth teams uh, that investors should not um, uh, miss. Um, as you can see, it's a combination from FDI beneficiary to the AI data centers um, to the Johor place. Um, so basically, I think um, some of these names are, are overlap. Uh, within the 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 respective uh, categorization, um, because they actually they actually you know uh, uh, kind of um, in between FDIs um, as well as AI data centers, for instance, um, I think that it has it is also very timely. Uh, we actually initiated on on another industrial name um just just this morning, um in time for 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 the second quarter outlook. Um, I think that within the AI data centers, uh, I think that um, we, we recently initiated on critical as well as a HE group. Right? So these two actually serve the semicon as well as the data center space. Um, so I think apart from the three, th uh, the, the three uh, thematics, I think that um, in these slides is, is basically highlighting the new slow driven construction um, the electric vehicles, as well as some of the earnings recovery, whereby we highlight uh, some oil and gas names, um, as well as uh, a, a glove, right? Um, so basically, this is our expectation of the KLCI uh, next rebalancing in June. Um, basically, um, as you can see, um, the, 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 the name highlighted in orange, um, basically, we, we see the possibility of Sunway um, being uh, included into the CI uh, in June. So I think that to, 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 to sum it up, um, despite the strong market performance, uh, we still see room for market to actually grow, grow further. Um, I think overall, we are still relatively optimistic on the market. I think that the market weakness, like what we saw this morning, uh, due to the Israel-Iran uh, conflict is an opportunity for investors to actually accumulate. Um, and we highlighted our top 10 buys and, and, and some of the thematic uh, buy calls that we think that you know, um, uh, investors uh, should actually um, not miss out on. I think that uh, no changes in terms of our KLCI target at uh, 1590. I think that um, uh, for the ringgit front, uh, we are expecting it to, to strengthen, like I mentioned earlier, towards the 440, 450 uh, from, from the current level. Um, and of course, um, um, we, we do think that um, the brand global oil price will likely stay elevated at, at, at this current level. Okay, so uh, I will stop here um, for now and allow my colleagues uh, to take over from here. I think that for today, uh, we will be highlighting on three sectors. Uh, we will start by construction, moving on to industrial, as well as uh, tech. Um, I'll, I'll pass on to uh, our colleague um, on the construction and industrial. Okay, Jun, thanks. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I'll start off with you know, my construction sector overview. So basically for construction uh, side, uh, we are expecting infra projects to roll out. Uh, which is backed by the government's commitment to allocate at least 90 billion for development 
from you know twenty twenty three all the way to twenty twenty five. This is a uh, uh, quite a uh, quite an increase from the original eighty billion, and then uh, but then it's slightly that uh the infra projects that we see rolling out in in the coming months uh would most likely be infra projects outside of Klang Valley such as Penang, Sabah, and Sarawak, Johor to roll out first. Because uh, as some of the arguments have always been that the infra budget have been too concentrated within Klang Valley previously, so it's likely that uh the government will, will, will put more emphasis on other states first uh in in, in the coming few months lah. With that uh, based on our channel checks with some of the construction companies, it's likely that the uh, MRT three tender award will be deferred to twenty twenty five. But then, and, uh, as I mentioned, the infra projects throughout would likely be focused in other states as well. So at the meantime, Penang RIT just received green light from the government in March. So that uh, basically now the Penang RIT is a, is a goal. But then in terms of the project cost or this, the MRT Corp and uh, SRS Consortium, which is 60% owned by Gamuda, is uh, currently in a negotiation on the finalized, uh, to, to finalize the project cost. Uh, and it's expected to conclude in six months. And then besides that, some other infra projects that we should uh, look out for would be the Penang Inter International Airport, uh, Pan Borneo Highway at Sabah, and also uh, Johor LRT. But this is still very prelim preliminary, so uh, uh, we, we, we should look out for the news flow, lah, for the following news flow. And then in terms of uh, the data center investments, it's also providing an uh, opportunity for quite a lot of uh, contractors to replenish the order book. And basically, the data center investments in Malaysia are expected to remain robust. And basically, for contract, uh, for for this team, uh, the beneficiary uh, would be contractors with infrastructure and DC track record. And our topics uh for the sector would be Gamuda and Kajai Prospect. Uh, next one. Okay, so I'll go a little bit more into details for uh, Penang RT since it's uh, recently approved. Uh, so. As for the alignment for the first segment, it's likely to be you know as shown in the photo, uh, whereby it's expected to have twenty three stations along Komta on the way to Silicon Island A, which basically is an island that is currently being reclaimed by Gamuda, and then overall, uh, although the 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 uh, project cost is still in negotiation, we're expecting the construction uh works to be in the range of seven to eight billion now. And then uh, we're expecting the works to commence in second half 2024. And uh, moving forward, uh, we, we expect the open tender for the second and third segments to eventually come in the next few years to you know, basically complete this whole Penang RT system, whereby basically the second segment is expected to link uh, Penang Island to the mainland. And then well, the third segment is basically the turnkey contract for the systems and trains. Uh, uh, overall, we expect Gamuda to take charge of the construction due to its uh, project delivery partner role. While it's also likely that some of the works will be subdivided into smaller packages to share with other uh, contractors. Uh, in terms of potential beneficiaries, uh, some of the contractors that are expected to bid for the packages uh, include uh, Suncon, IGM, and MRCB. And the next slide. Basically, we reiterate our OVID call on the construction sector as we anticipate our coverage to you know, benefit from the rollout of uh, this mega infrastructure projects, the influx of data center investments, and also some uh, the, the consistent uh, contracts from the resilient property market. And then uh, top sector buys are still Gamuda and Kajaya, given the strong position that they hold in the respective uh, construction subsectors of infra uh, building construction. And then both are uh, trading at an undemanding 12 times forward PE. Uh, we, besides that, we also have a buy call on AME Elite, which uh, basically we see them as a unique exposure for investors to capture the influx of FDIs. As you know, AME Elite is actively developing industrial parks at uh, FDI hotspots hot such as Johor and Penang. Uh, okay, next slide. Um, I think one slide back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
for Gamuda, basically our TP is at uh, 655. And then we like Gamuda's for its regional exposure for both uh, construction and also property. And then basically Gamuda is well positioned to benefit from the rollout of Penang RT contracts, as I mentioned just now. And besides that, the group is also, you know, actively uh, getting infrastructure jobs in Australia, Taiwan, and Singapore as well. So they, they are not solely reliant on the Malaysia infrastructure projects. So that, that that's one of the key things that set them apart from the peers as well. And then uh, Gamuda also recently expressed optimism in securing at least two data center uh, projects in, in this uh, financial year, while they are uh, expecting to maintain similar contract win momentum, which basically they are expecting to win two data center jobs every year la, in a data center space. And with that, uh, we believe uh, Gamuda's current valuation of 12 times uh, for PE seems very attractive. Uh, our target price is packed to uh, 18 times construction profit and also the INV of its property site. Uh, okay, next. Okay, for Kajayan Prospect, we, we like the consistency in delivering uh, above average uh, PAT margin of 10 over percent uh, versus industry average of 5 to 8 percent. And then basically, Kajaya has been consistently securing uh, high rise construction jobs from reputable clients such as Singapore and UAM Sunrise. And also, they are kind of like a good proxy to benefit from one of its related party companies, Eastern uh, ENO, which who, who is basically developing an uh, reclaim island at the northern side of Penang, which is called Andaman Island. And that island basically gives uh, ENO you know, basically uh, 20 over billion GDV that will be un gradually unlocked in the next 15 years. And Kajaya has been the go-to contractor for, for this uh, development. Now. So with that, you, you can basically expect very consistent contracts coming into Kajaya as you know, uh, ENO develop this 20 billion uh, island in the next 15 years. And then other than that, uh, they also have a joint venture with uh, Samsung. Uh, this basically opens up opportunities for the group to venture into design and build contract for some of the advanced production, uh, production facilities job. Uh, one of the uh, ongoing one is uh, the Texas Instrument Factory in Malacca. Uh, valuation seems attractive, 12 times, uh, at, to trading at 12 times for PE. Uh, for the target price, we are setting at about 16 times. Next for industrial, uh, yes, uh, as mentioned by JY just now, uh, for our industri industrial side, we basically like uh, this MEP engineering providers. Uh, and then for them, they basically benefit from uh, two teams, basically the data center team and also the FDI team. So, uh, so I'll briefly go into the data center landscape in Malaysia. So for Malaysia, they have, uh, we have a attracted more than 76 billion worth of uh, data center investments. And this is attributable to the you know, favorable conditions such as uh, welcoming government policies, the availability of land and power, and also the which results in basically a uh, relatively low average cost for these data center operators to set up uh, the data centers in Malaysia. As, uh, as I quote one of the independent uh, research uh, where basically Malaysia DC average cost is estimated at about 10 US do uh, 10 uh, 10 dollar per watt uh, lower than some of our uh, ASEAN peers such as Singapore and Jakarta and this has basically attracted several uh, major DC operators such as Air Trunk, uh, GDS, Zillowood to you know uh, set up their data centers in, in, in Malaysia la. and basically they have secured more than 1,500 megawatt for their Johor based data centers. This this basically means that they, they, they secured the uh, electricity electricity supply for you know all these uh, data centers and then ad additionally they are expected to uh, establish another uh, that they are expected to be more data center facilities that would be uh, coming in with another 2,000 megawatt uh, demand for power. And with this, uh, we estimate this 2,000 megawatt to potentially generate additional investments of 94 billion ringgit, assuming average cost of uh, $10 per watt. And next. And then, as I mentioned, uh, we, we like uh, the MEP solution providers as they are well positioned to benefit from the growth of all these structural growth uh, that the end users, la, where it includes semiconductor, 
data center, telecommunication, and solar. Overall, the uh, industry grew about 15% uh, throughout uh, the past few years. And then the, basically the increasing demand for MEP and engineering will be driven by the growth of its end users, as I mentioned. And then uh, as they correlate with the higher domestic and foreign investments, and also the uh, trade diversion play, and also basically they, they, they are, they are uh, expected to benefit from the growth prospects of the uh, semiconductor or E&E &E ecosystem in Penang as well. And yep. And with all that, uh, we see this MEP players as a proxy of rising FDIs, uh, given the exposure in semiconductor and data center. Our sub sector topics are critical and HE group. And then uh, for critical, they are basically uh, set to you know capitalize on the semiconductor sector recovery, as I mentioned just now, and also the enormous uh, DC investment opportunities in Malaysia. And basically with that, uh, the, the order book replenishment prospects is likely to be positive, backed by its sizable 1.2 billion tender book, which has doubled in the past few months. Lah. And then uh, critical's ROE stands out above average uh, at 69%. While it sits on a uh, strong balance sheet with 49 million net cash position. And then uh, this uh, HG group is our newly initiated, we just initiated our HG group this uh, morning. So basically, HG group is a uh, electrical uh, engineering service uh, provider. That I mean, they're they are predominantly the electrical engineering service provider, but uh, they, they stand as a strong beneficiary of FDI with a high ex exposure of their revenue, 70 to 80%, coming from semiconductor and E&E and &E end users. And besides that, the HE group is also expanding their footprint into data center space through a partnership with Vertif. And basically, we're expecting them to uh, secure some data center jobs moving forward. Uh, HE groups net. Uh, is standing at a net cash position of 50 over million or so. This provides a uh, sample of room for the group to you know, grow and expand its capabilities potentially via uh, m and and eventually become an integrated MEP solution provider. As I mentioned just now, they are more, they are, they are currently more on the electrical side, which is the E of the MEP solution. So eventually they, they will acquire more capabilities for the M and P uh, capabilities or so. Overall, we're expecting a three-year profit giga of 50%, uh, trading at 12 times uh, forward PE, attractive. Uh, our target price is packed to 18 times. And then now I'll pass on to my colleague, uh, Lucas, for the tech sector. Thanks, Kajan. So yeah, right, right now I'd like to share with everyone our findings and the view of the overall tech sector. So just like I mentioned uh, last time, after going through a slowdown last year, we continue to see a recovery to take place in the second half uh, of this year. And our views are still pretty much in line with uh, you know, market intelligence, such as you know the WSTS, SEMI, and et cetera. As they uh, each of them forecast a recovery between 10 to 20% uh, from the contraction in 2023. So we see the tech sector experiencing a growing demand for new and advanced technologies such as the AI and smaller NM chip. So we believe this will drive the demand, especially in the memory segment, as higher bandwidth memory, uh, or for short HBM, is required to run and support these uh, processing capabilities of these AI chips. And this segment is forecasted to grow about 40% uh, year on year. While other segments are also poised for an uptrend uh, with the US and APAC regions leading the growth. So some of the recent updates uh, that we can find uh, reported by Sammy is like during the year end period of last year, sales of uh, for electronics and ICs, this shows some improvement you know, and cited that also demand uh, has recovered as well as the inventory levels have started to normalize. So, uh, and these sales are projected to continue this momentum uh, for 2024. Uh, but for CAPEX and FED utilization rates uh, will start the year with a mild recovery uh, after the, the declines in second half uh, last year. Uh, similarly, uh, equipment bills were also above expectations in the end of last year and was foreseen to have about a muted growth in the first half due to seasonality reasons, but still remain an overall growth throughout 2024. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just like I mentioned earlier, the global sales, semiconductor sales are projected to grow and SIA and IDC forecast like a 30 and 20% growth respectively with global PC and smart, small, smartphone shipments signals improvement in demand after suffering from economic challenges as well as high inventory. So some updates on that. Overall, we are seeing uh, slow and steady improvements in these two segments. Uh, the global smartphone shippers declined in overall in 2023, but it has seen better than expected uh, performance in the second half last year. Uh, they showed a 9% year near growth uh, during the last quarter. And for the global PC shipments, it's also surpassed uh, expectations slightly in fourth quarter last year, uh, which indicates a solid recovery trend to be paid for uh, 2024. Uh, you can see that in the bottom right chart there, you see right during the end of last year, there's an uptick uh, from the downward trend throughout uh, 2022 and 2023. Yeah. So we see these improvements to be driven by new and emerging technologies, uh, like I mentioned earlier, like an AI, uh, which is expected to pay this sector renewed our growth, uh, our growth trend, uh, further backed by the dissipation of inventory levels. And this also can be supported uh, by uh, comments such as a TSMC, a key foundry player uh, for major global fabulous companies, where they express like optimism for a more robust growth for this year, uh, taking account of their customers depleting inventory uh, in the PC, smartphone, and the automotive segments. As well as uh, Sunco. Sunco is one of the largest silicon wafer producers uh, in the market, uh, in the world, sorry. Uh, we, they see like a uh, market bottoming out in the fourth quarter last year, as well as uh, this coming first quarter 24. And they don't expect any further market uh, condition to deteriorate. And overall, they state that, you know, first half will still be a bit tough while expecting a stronger rebound in second half. And in the test space, uh, similarly, uh, they see uh, increment improvement for this year uh, due to their newer 3 nn technology in the mobility space as well as the PC uh, smartphone market. And geopolitics wise, we'll still put the Malaysian tech sector in line with what uh, JY has presented regarding the uh, trade diversion play. Hence, uh, this Malaysia will be in a favorable position uh, to driving in inflow of FD FDI into the region. While MNCs, you know, seek for alternative location and suppliers through initiatives that you may have heard online as in the news, such as a Taiwan plus one and a China plus one. Yeah. And you know, this can be uh this is evident as you can see, like recent news announcements, you know, by uh made by uh, you know leading uh wafer equipment makers like RAM Research or even Micron, which is a memory player, or or investing a big amount of money into Penang. And and over the next few years as well. So this with these expansion plans, we can see Malaysia's importance in this semiconductor supply chain, especially in the midst of this geopolitical tension. Uh, next slide, please. So overall, uh, we like to maintain our overweight uh, call on the tech sector as we anticipate our coverages to benefit from this inflows of FDI. Uh, as you know, tensions rise between US and China, as well as and also the growing popularity for AI powered devices and electronic device e vehicles. So we advocate investors to start looking into strong secular trends such as you know automotive, data centers, medical tech, as and 5G. Uh, but the anticipated ringgit strength may dampen earnings because uh, many of our local tech companies do their business in USD. Uh, and also with the global Inflation coupled with the U.S. Fed fund rates, you know, uh, reducing the interest in this year, should see investors shifting back into this growth myth. Our top picks for this sector are UWC and Pantamaster, as they hold in the respective, you know, front and back end, as well as automotive exposures towards the this trade diversification. And if you're looking for a unique exposure to AI and EV, uh, we see Franken and great tech as key beneficiaries for this new and advanced technologies that have been released or are yet to be unveiled to the market. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, touching a bit on uh, UWC, 
So U2SC is uh, strategically positioned to benefit uh, from its move into the front end semiconductor market on the back of recovery in this uh, global boundary capital spending that uh, we have mentioned before. Uh, we have a target price of uh, 3.68 cents. So uh, what U2SC does is it, they turn big metal components into small components, you know, using like milling machines, PNC, uh, and they assemble these parts into finished and uh, semi-finished products. So overall, we like uh, UWC's move into this lucrative front-end market that delivers higher margin and profits. Uh, so what is front-end? Uh, as many of many of you might not know, so basically front-end is basically like the initial stages of uh, creating uh, these chips that you see that is in your phones and in your laptops and this is where like the raw materials, like what some call creates uh, from the silicon wafers, undergo like a series of uh, processes to form like the structures of the chip. And you can think of it as laying the foundation and constructing the framework of a building. Yeah. So, and the front end uh, addressable market is six to seven times larger uh, than the back end uh, addressable market, which makes it more lucrative for UWC that is tapping into it right now. Uh, so UWC is moving to serve customers in this front-end semiconductor uh, market and they also stand to benefit uh, from these MNCs, you know, uh, diversifying out of China, you know, and investing in Malaysia. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. And for Pentamas, uh, and for Pentamaster, uh, they are set to capitalize on the emerging you know, SIC or silicon carbide and the automation solutions uh, bought by the overall EV demand trend. Uh, we, have, we, have a, we have a target price for 565 cents and Pentamaster produces uh, automation equipment for the semicon and EV players such as uh, testers to test the chips at the wafer level or the package level before they go into the final assembly of the full products. So uh, we like Pentamaster's uh, specialization in IGPT and SIC assembly and uh, test solutions. So uh, maybe a bit quick uh, a description of what is IGPT. So IGPT is basically a very important uh, electrical electronic component, which is used in uh, many applications as well, particularly in power electronics. So uh, who uses a lot of power electronics? Uh, basically uh, EVs. Uh, and but they're also used in uh, other industries such as solar and home appliances. As for silicon carbide, it's actually a material uh, blend of silicon and also carbide. And this is uh, silicon, you can see silicon carbide is like an upgrade of the traditional silicon uh, chip that's used in uh, power devices. And it's an uh, upgrade because of its uh, superior electrical field strength, you know, larger band gap, and also uh, reduce power loss, better durability, basically uh, a, a lot of things better. Lah. Yeah, and hence posi positioning it as a future of a power device tech. So the uh, advantages of this uh, SIC technology is becoming more and more notable at the higher voltages required for EV batteries. So, uh, and this is uh, anticipated to dominate the production of future EVs. Yeah, so, uh, Another growth factor for Pentamaster will come from them expanding it into you know, the manufacturing facility for medical automation as the business diversification over its uh, heavy reliance on the automotive segment. So they yeah, are getting uh, more and more customers in this segment and, pro and also to diversify from this uh, automotive segment. So both uh, automotive and medical is seen to be a high, higher growth for Pentamaster. And of course, uh, Pentamaster would stand to benefit from the US export sanctions to China. And that would be it for my uh, sector presentation. And we'll dive into Q&A. Yeah, OK. Uh, thanks, Kejun. Uh, thanks, Lucas. Uh, I think that uh, since uh, we have a couple more minutes, I think that um, probably I'll just run through a bit on the oil and gas sector. I think that, again, it's timely. Um, to uh, update on the sector considering the Israel and Iran uh, tension. I think that overall, 
um, we, we do expect uh, global oil price to remain supported uh, even so um, under this uh, uncertain time. Uh, if you look in terms of the Petronas KPEX spending, I think that um, 300 billion over the next five years is, is looking uh, quite encouraging. Um, the global industrial KPEX um, is also expected to grow further. I think that if you look in terms of the Petronas Activity Outlook uh, report, which is an uh, annual report being um, updated by Petronas, I think that overall the activities are still looking quite uh, rosy. So, so as such, uh, this is why we actually uh, have an overview on the sector. Uh, basically, um, if you look across of our four um four buy calls, uh, Dayang is actually in the whole Hoka commissioning as well as uh, MCM segment. Uh, Pentec is a one of the benefic huge beneficiary of the FDIs. Um, especially um your Pengarang, your your China FDIs. Uh, Usma is actually in the in the uh, plant abandonment space, which is also a beneficiary of, of the Petronas Activity Outlook. And, and, and lastly is on uh, Bumi Armada. I think that Bumi Armada is the only company which do not benefit from the Petronas Activity Outlook being a global uh, player. Uh, but that being said, I think that with, uh, again, global industrial capex um, expected to increase, we, we do believe that that will actually benefit um, uh, Bumi Amada as well. So, I mean, as you can see in, in the morning session, um, the oil and gas uh, um, um, sector has, has done well. Uh, despite we have, I think, over 900 over losers uh, um, um, that actually declined um, this morning. And, and we do believe that investors should, should definitely uh, uh, focus on, 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 on this uh, sector as well. And Pentec and... Uh, Dayang is our topic uh, within the sector, but in terms of our upside, uh, we do, uh, in terms of upside, uh, it's actually Usma and uh, Pentec. Okay, so that's on the, that's on the oil and gas side. Um, and I will, and we will stop here for, for some Q&A, uh, but I think that for the time being, let me just um, bring you guys back to the thematic buy in case there's any questions relating to our thematics. Okay. Um. I think I think throughout the presentations, uh, we 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 do focus, um, on the ringgit. I think that. Um, although ringgit is looking relatively uh, weak at the for the time being, um, but we do think that there will be um, certain sectors that will actually benefit from it. Um, of course, the oil and gas, um, which is actually um, billing in 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 US dollar, um, the tech as well. So I think this 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 two uh, sector will definitely uh, benefit in terms of the weaker ringgit. Uh, but that being said, um, just a refresher for, for those that might have missed, we are expecting um, a stronger ringgit in the second half towards the 440 and 450 from the current 470, 480. Okay, um, there's also a question on top three that is worth to explore. Okay, I think in terms of the top three um, within our top 10 buy universe is definitely um, this, this slides that uh, investors should actually uh, focus on. This is basically our country topics. And by upside, it's uh, Keep EMS, um, UMedic, as well as uh, Pentec. Uh, but again, um, if you look in terms of our thematic buys, um, across the different thematics, um, we do have we we have already arranged the companies by upside. So if you guys like, you guys can take a picture um, and see what thematics um, um, you guys are comfortable with, and um, position uh, accordingly. Um, yeah.
Okay, um, questions on Nation Gate. Um, Nation Gate is also one of our uh, top 10 buys. Um, basically, I think um, being one of the industrial uh, EMS um, company, I think that they are definitely going to benefit greatly from the FBI inflows. Um, they are also in the AI data center teams, uh, which are highlighted, yeah, which we have highlighted under the AI data center as well. Um, I think that uh, a lot of them will actually come into flotation towards a uh, later part of the year and possibly next year, um, latest. Um, and, and, and if you look in terms of our EPS growth, I think the EPS growth is looking very decent uh, for 2024 as well as uh, 2025. Um, but value, but do note that valuation it's uh is is slightly on the high side, right? Um, it's trading at about eighteen times uh forward twenty twenty five uh PE. Um, so if you are looking at some uh, some others FDI beneficiaries or AI data center uh proxies, um um, there are some other uh, uh names that you you might want to consider which actually come with a cheaper. Um, more attractive valuation. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh dividend. Okay. Uh, I think I think in terms of dividend yield wise. Um. I think that uh Pentec, I think that Pentec is um, maybe a uh, Pentec has about six over percent yield. Um Kajaya Prospect has close to about five percent yield. So something that um you all might want to consider six over percent, uh six over percent for Pentec, five percent for Kajaya. I think that for the rest wise, uh Lagenta also has close to about five percent dividend yield. Um yeah. Um, I think pretty uh for for the rest, pretty much is still quite low. Um, but of course, um, based on my uh what I heard from my glove uh analysts, um, Kosan, I think that Kosan management um is actually guiding that when the market supply the uh, supply uh demand dynamics actually recover, they are looking to pay off a one off special dividend. Um, so although that. Um, the COSAN dividend is about 0.9%, which is about 1%. I think that this has not factored in the one of special dividend, um, which might be something that you, you, you want to uh, consider as well. Um, okay, uh, top glove. Um, I think that we, we only like Hatariga and Kosa for the time being. I think that uh, in terms of um, the cost structure, in terms of the net cash position, um, top glove is actually not that attractive. Um, so hence, um, due to the in, uh, ineffective uh, cost structure, we, we do prefer the more efficient player uh, being uh, Hatariga and Kosa. Uh, okay, uh, Black Swan event, um, of course, uh, the reason why it's called Black Swan is uh, no one can really predict what's going on. Um, but I think that um, market, more market volatility is, uh, is, is always there. Um, but that being said, I think that if you were to stay invested in the market in the, in, the long, in, in the long term, I think that generally investors will definitely get a positive return from the market. Um, so um, regardless whether there's any black, black swan event, uh, we do recommend to uh, position yourself in the structural growth teams, um, which actually have story for the next three, five years. Um, and most importantly, there's a very clear earnings visibility. There's a very good story. Valuation is not too expensive. I think that all these criteria combined should actually weather uh, uh, whether investors are uh, through the uh, and any unforeseen global events. Okay, um, I think that we have uh, hit the one hour mark.
uh, Roshan, uh, over back to you. Thanks. All right, fantastic. Thanks again, JY, Kajun, and Lucas for the presentation and interactive Q&A. We have now come to the end of the webinar today, and we would like to thank you all for joining. For Wednesday, we will be sharing the outlook and stock picks for the Thailand market. Chutikan Santi Metviru, Head of Equity Strategy, and Adison Mung Panchon, Assistant Vice President from Philip Capital Thailand, will cover the Thai market outlook, top pick stocks based on outstanding investment themes, and new Thai SDRs. Remember to mark your calendars. It's on the 17th of April, Wednesday from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. For the session just now, we will be uploading the recording on Philip Capital's YouTube channel. You may view the recording of the webinar on your own time. Also, we have many other interesting webinars going on almost every other day. You may view our full list of free webinars on our website. Do take your time to fill in the survey so we can improve your experience with us in the future. You may scan the QR code or copy the survey link posted on the chat tab. You may also join our investing communities to get free access to full research reports and discussion on technical analysis. Once again, thank you all for joining us, and we hope to see you on Wednesday. Stay tuned, take care, and have a nice day.